Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we'll wrap the week, do our normal Friday routine where we break down the activity Friday to Friday, see how the world has evolved. The S&P choppy, which is pretty normal on a quad witching day. It's sort of the op options expiration day, but really accelerating back to the upside going into the close. We'll have to see how all the charts are laying out uh, going into this weekend before the uh, holiday season begins. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close, especially on a Friday as we debrief on the activity of the markets through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, decision making, investor psychology, sentiment, behavior, all that good stuff. And uh, try to make sense of this uh, this choppy, volatile, uh, insecure market is how I would describe it. Just a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of movement, and and at the end of this day sort of summarizes where things are at. Sort of a distribution day for much of the afternoon, and then the last thirty minutes you sort of accelerate to the upside. So an interesting way to finish this week. Uh, we're going to look at all of the uh, of the charts and how they've evolved from Friday to Friday. That's my favorite part of this. Uh, of this week's uh, this day of the week uh, for the final bars because we can really focus on the long term trends and how they've uh, they've evolved. Let's talk about the schedule coming up. We have had some really really fantastic guests this week. Um, the last couple uh, days we had Dr. Alan Elman yesterday breaking down a covered call trade. On Wednesday we had Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity. Those two are fresh in my mind. Just some really thoughtful uh, uh, points that they made about uh, about their area of expertise. So I'd encourage you to go check out their shows. This is our last live show of 2020. We're going to take the next two weeks off as we set the stage for 2021. And please make sure that you check out our special programming for year end called Reflections 2020. I've previewed a bunch of the content. It's really, really fantastic. And, and I think we'll uh, help you uh, focus on how to wrap this uh, year up, which, is, which sounds like a very difficult thing to do, given all of the movements, all the uncertainty that we've had. Three areas of focus for you. Number one, starting on Monday, we have a series of videos called Reevaluating Your Process. I did an event uh, called 10 Questions I Asked Myself at Year End. Gaddis Rose did a fantastic discussion about how he wraps his year. Keith Fitzgerald talked about um, you know, how you should approach performance and, and develop better routines for next year. So some really good uh, videos to help you take a step back from your own process. The week after, Julius DeKempener is leading a discussion on sector rotation. He's going to talk about how the sectors have evolved. We have some analysts digging deep into individual sectors. They'll talk about the themes you should be aware of going into next year. And then over the course of these next two weeks, starting on Monday, we have 10 strategists, each giving their top technical theme of the year. So 10 days, 10 strategists, 10 key charts. It's going to be a really good exercise. And I think if you follow all of those special events, you're going to have a really good sense of uh, how things have evolved this year, how to start to approach your investment uh, year next year, and, uh, and certainly hope you have a great holiday season as we do all of the above. Let's uh, get into our weekly wrap session, our wrap of the week. And I wanted to start with a poll. I asked you recently, will the next 10% move in the S&P 500 be higher or lower? This is a common question we would ask uh, on the institutional side. We loved uh, you know, talking with people and, and trying to get a sense of, uh, of where they were at uh, in terms of next steps. I just want to highlight, this is our using our ACP uh, functionality. Here's the S&P closed right around 3,700 uh, today, which is poetic. 10% higher would put us around 4070, right? 4,070. 10% lower would put us around 3330. So 10% higher, obviously we're pushing well above previous highs. We'd be above 4,000 uh, for the first time, which would be a pretty significant uh, move higher. 66% uh, of you, two out of three said that was what was next. Uh, a third of you said the next 10% move would be lower, which puts us in, in the 33-30 range. What's fascinating is that doesn't even put us between, you know, below the low from October. 10% down feels like a long way down. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's 10%. That, like, that's a number. But it's not even below the low from, uh, you know, from uh, early November, from late October, right, or, or, or the low from September. So that's putting us still within that uh, wiggle room of the, uh, of the, of the pullback from, 
uh, from the uh, you know, earlier in this uh, in this fall period. So two out of three of you saying higher. I didn't respond to this one. If I had to respond, I would probably say lower, only because I think we'll continue to move higher. But I'm think I'm seeing January, February feels like a pretty decent pullback opportunity. I wouldn't be surprised if we sort of retest um, some of that uh, some of that area. And I and I say that just based on extreme breadth, extreme sentiment that that seems very similar to me before we get a pullback of uh, of meaning. But again, price is king as long as the price remains in an uptrend, higher highs or higher lows, the path of least resistance certainly remains positive. So certainly keep that in mind. Let's uh, continue to wrap the week. Again, overall, you can see on the on the small preview chart, the S&P really jumped uh, to close uh, just above 3,700 there, but uh, we'll have to see as we digest all the closing prices where, uh, where things played out. The NASDAQ finished about 0.1% lower mid caps and small caps even more. The small cap index really was uh, the worst of the, uh, of the bunch here. The VIX just below 22. On the bond side, we had bonds uh, in form of the TLT down about a third of a percent with 10-year yields back around 95 basis points, testing that key 1% level. I think so many do not imagine that the market, that, that rates will be able to go higher than that, which is probably one of the contrarian reasons why I think it absolutely will in the new, in the new year, but we'll see. Uh, gold, a little bit weaker, just flat to down. Silver, down about 0.8%, but the rest of the commodity space higher with oil prices moving higher as well. Bitcoin continuing to uh, impress, sort of, uh, you know, chopping around a bit, just below 23,000. This is after breaking above 20,000 20, and staying there for the first time. So, uh, you know, certainly has been, uh, you know, a euphoric rise this week. We'll see here as we go to our weekly uh, relative movement charts, how much that has happened. In terms of sectors, I just want to point out energy, you know, in terms of key themes, energy rotating lower again today. And we talked about the bearish divergence that we saw in things like the OIH and, uh, and other um, you know, oil services, the OSX and other energy um, benchmarks. So certainly following through on that, I think that uh, that, that certainly indicated uh, an exhaustion to the upside and, and certainly seeming to play out so far. On the positive side today, you have materials, which has not really been on the top very often. Um, so that's interesting to look at. You may want to focus on some of those names if you've not seen them and see what is working, what's breaking out there. Let's go to our weekly wrap. I like to start with this chart, which is the um, the last five days on these major asset classes. My labels might have bounced around a bit uh, because things were fluctuating quite a bit going into the close, but I'm sure you can see with the color coding where everything is at. Uh, the S&P 500 finished uh, up about 1.2% for the week. This is from last Friday's close. What outperformed uh, the S&P this week? Emerging markets up about 1.5%. Gold about 2.3%, the NASDAQ 100 up 27 small caps up uh, just under 3%. Crude oil, the big winner out of this basket, up 4.8%. Uh, what underperformed stocks this week? The US dollar was down another 1.1%. Again, if you're, if you're looking for an example of a stock breaking to new lows consistently, the US dollar, hard to find a better example than that right about now, USD, dollar sign USD certainly showing weakness. And if you flip that over, things like the euro, the Canadian dollar, you can see making new highs. And that's uh, sort of the inverse of the US dollar chart. Bonds, the worst out of the bucket, down 1.4%. Now, which, it, what am I missing here? Any major thing we've talked about that's not on here? Uh, correct guess if you said Bitcoin. I actually took it off because it was skewing the rest of them so much. So everything we just looked at is down here at the bottom. Here's Bitcoin up 27% for the week. So I know a lot of investors have avoided cryptocurrencies and I don't blame you. And I certainly, there have been times when I've not referred to it often on the show, because I think for most people focusing on other asset classes sort of makes sense. But you know the movement that you've seen, and it's not just this week, which has obviously been pretty extreme to the upside. This has been momentum that's been building for a while. And you've seen this thing come up as Bitcoin has broken 10,000, then 12,000, then 14, then 16, 18, and now up to 20 and beyond. So if you've not paid attention to it, thought about how they fit into an asset allocation decision, I'd encourage you to start incorporating it. Um, you know, dollar sign BTC USD is the, is the way to look at actual Bitcoin uh, prices, uh, you know, in terms of tradable securities other than that, GBTC tends to be the one we find most commonly accessed on our platform, which is, a, which is an investment trust, uh, which, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, related to the price of Bitcoin for sure. Um, so check those out if you haven't. But certainly that's been the, uh, the, the if, you, if you group everything together, throw it in a pile, uh, that's certainly been the biggest gainer out of the, uh, out of the basket. In terms of other quick themes to, uh, to hit on going into the close, I don't think much more. I'd like to get into the Mindful Investor Live chart list if we can and kind of dig into there. You know, maybe tobacco stocks are an interesting one. We haven't talked about these in a while, but, you know, if you look at the tobacco index, I'd, I'd be focusing on themes like this as we go into year end. What's really starting to break out? What's starting to 
you know, show some uh, increasing momentum. And we've talked about Philip Morris, Altria, uh, and some of these stocks that have done well. It's interesting to see the, the um, tobacco group is actually broken above its September high now. Uh, and now that becomes support, which it was tested this week, and now closing on a, a, a high for a week, a new 10-month high. Uh, for the uh, for the group and the relative strength starting to improve. If I was looking for ideas right now, I would be looking for you know groups that are able to break out, groups where the relative strength is improving, things that are able to prove that uh, they have some upside potential relative to uh, others. Auto is the number one group, and obviously Tesla is a big uh, you know a big driver in that. Tesla joining the S and P five hundred uh, today. Uh, if you missed it, and uh, that's sort of off schedule. It's sort of a one off addition to the S and P, which is a little unusual. Uh, and it, it felt like Tesla was not going to make it in the S&P. And now all of a sudden it is uh, overall that, you know, tends to be a, a good thing for uh, for a stock, but also is going to inject some volatility as institutions and others have to sort of think about their allocation to Tesla. So certainly be watching that chart if you uh, if you haven't yet to see how it digests this news uh, into the next week and, uh, and into the new year as well. Let's continue on to the Mindful Investor Live chart list. We'll spend the rest of the time here. And if you've not seen this before, the way you access this is go to the articles page, uh, go up here where it says all stock charts, blogs, go to mine, which is called the Mindful Investor. You'll see some fantastic articles, but at the top, you'll see live chart lists that'll get us right to the point we're going to start uh, here. You're welcome to take these and use them in your own work. Starting with the market trend model, this is a weekly model using uh, exponential moving averages uh, to quickly summarize. And it's a broken record of sorts. All three time frames, short term, medium term, long term, have remained bullish really since early November. The medium term model sort of did a head fake, turned negative a little bit in uh, mid October, turned back positive. The first week in November has remained positive as the S&P's continued on to new highs. So again, just successive new highs uh, every week is gonna push these, uh, these trend following devices higher for good reason. So all across the board, it's telling you that the trend has been positive. And again, that's not a, that's not a judgment call, it's not an opinion, that's just a fact based on the, uh, on the trends. Higher highs, higher lows, until that's different, the trend is positive for stocks. The daily S&P chart, you're showing a, you know, a bit of distribution. It looked a lot worse earlier in the day as we were trading near the lows. We sort of recovered and finished just above halfway of the, uh, the day's range. But you know, overall, if you think of the, the bigger picture, we broke out of this consolidation range from September September and October, really sat around that 3550 to 3600 level and that resolved to the upside. Now, in the short term, this 3700 range has sort of served as resistance. And I think going into next week, the question will be, do we follow through on a fairly positive week this week and continue that on into, uh, into next week, push above 3700, at which point, I, I mean, just the sky's the limit as you continue to see uh, to see higher highs. In a pullback, 3550 to 3600 is the 50 day moving average. It's the congestion range from back here in November where we sat after we broke out above the previous highs. And it's also the high from last year uh, back here in September. So that's a pretty logical pullback point. I think that would be the first uh, point to consider. If that holds, then the trend remains positive. If not, then you have to start looking to some of these other areas and where a deeper uh, correction would be. And as a reminder, when we talk about 10% up or down, 10% up is up here in the 40, 4,200, 4,300, 10% down would be down here around 3,300, which would put us, you know, again, just above these, uh, these previous swing lows. In terms of breadth, the way I would summarize the breadth characteristics of the market are, uh, are positive and, 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 and by, by any measure, and we have a lot of different ways of measuring uh, breadth or, or another way to say that is participation. How are, how are individual stocks, what are they doing relative to the overall market? The cumulative advanced decline lines, which we're seeing here for four different buckets of stocks, the S&P, so large cap, mid cap, small cap at the top, is the New York Stock Exchange, all four of those making new highs again this week, all uh, continuing to push uh, to push higher, suggesting that, uh, you know, again, the, the trend is positive and that's supported by uh, pretty healthy breadth conditions. So until those lines start to turn down, even if the S&P sort of falters, it tells you that there are plenty of stocks continue to push higher. And that's what I would focus on. In terms of new highs, you know, one of the things that would make me be skeptical is if there's not enough new highs or not enough stocks able to push to, uh, to new highs as the S&P is trying to do so. Uh, in the last couple of days, you had about six, seven, eight percent of the S&P making new 52 week highs. That's not bad. Um, that's not extreme. At, at, at later stages of some bull markets, you've had well above that. You've had, uh, you know, three to four times that. Uh, here it's about seven, six to eight percent, which is not bad. That's sort of consistent for what we've seen for much of uh, 220, uh, 2020. So no, no real uh, cause for concern there. You know, one interesting data point, if you caught my conversation with Tony Dwyer on Wednesday, which if you missed that one, 
Uh, we had a lot of fun talking about the markets. He had some really good thoughts about uh, the macro conditions. And one of the things he and I talked about off camera was uh, the breadth conditions now versus 2009. And if you look at a bombed out market with almost 0% of the S&P above their 200 day to an extreme upside move, a euphoric move of over 90%, of the S&P in a positive. The only, the only time that's happened in recent history is in 2009 coming out of the 09 low. A lot of differences between now and then, obviously, but the breadth conditions are actually pretty similar. Another interesting chart is with sentiment. If you look at the AAII survey, you had the big spike in sentiment in early November and then a steady decrease in bullish readings, even though it's still above 40%. The time that that actually looks really similar to is 2018, the beginning there. If you look in January, we made a new high, extreme bullish sentiment. It's kind of what we saw here. And then the next month was sort of weaker sentiment as we made new highs. It's kind of what we're seeing here. So I'm curious if we're setting ourselves up for a bit of a 2018, you know, January pullback like we saw there. And again, overall, the trend, you know, continued higher after some choppiness, after some digestion. And maybe that's what we have in store for us in the, uh, in the first quarter. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Only other thing we have time for is want to point small caps continue to dominate. That is driven by uh, a lot of things, but a, a weaker dollar is certainly part of that. And if you look at U.S. versus the world, continues to slope downward. So if you've ignored non-U.S. stocks, I would strongly encourage you to think about non-U.S. exposure and where you might see some technically oriented opportunities, trends and breakouts that are starting to work. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. It's been a pleasure to uh, you know, run this show for the course of the years, our first full year of running The Final Bar, and, and we're very, very thankful you've come along with us. Uh, as a reminder, we'd love to hear from you, particularly questions that you're running into as you analyze your own charts. Shoot us an email at thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We'll be off the next couple of weeks in terms of our show, but we certainly be looking for your questions, which we will answer right at the beginning of next year. Also on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, look us up there or uh, on our YouTube channel. Just put a comment below the video you're watching and we'll answer you as many questions as we can. Let's open the Final Bar mailbag and get to some of your questions. These are all questions we've received in the last couple of days and appreciate all of you sending great questions, charts, uh, and uh, your thoughts. Question number one, what do you think about Amazon this week? Uh, this is in response to a video earlier. Um, you know, I actually talked, this is one of our um, uh, charts we talked about yesterday. I think this is one of the three and three charts, if I remember right. But, you know, with, with, with Amazon, I think if you look at Amazon relative to the average, you know, chart in history, it doesn't seem that bad because it's not going down. It's not a bad chart. It's a chart in a consolidation phase. And I have the purple lines illustrating lower highs, higher lows as a coil pattern or a symmetrical triangle pattern, a consolidation. If you look at the midpoint, it's right at 3,200. So what Amazon is basically telling you is it rallied to 3,200 here in July. That is the you know equilibrium price. That is the fair value for Amazon. And I can tell you that because for the last six months, we've basically been rotating right around that level. We're just overshooting and undershooting that equilibrium level. The way the market tells you that that's done and we need to get to a different valuation is either we break out to the upside or we break down to the to the downsides. So I think simply a break above 3,400 to break below 3,000 uh, would certainly suggest that that's the direction of momentum. That's the next uh, that's the next step. I think you know the interesting thing is if you look at Amazon versus all the other e-commerce stocks or whatever you'd put in those uh, bucket, you know, big holdings in those e-commerce ETFs, which we looked at on yesterday's show, you'll find that it's a, it's, it's a laggard in a big way versus those other names. So there are plenty of stocks like PayPal and Shopify and Stitch Fix and others that uh, have done much better. But overall, Amazon's not broken. And I think if I'm thinking of a good example chart as a market tell going into next year, Amazon might be the one I would pick uh, and just seeing which way this breaks. I think that might tell you about the next direction of the overall market. Question number two, when there's a lot of sector rotation slash flip-flopping going on, how do you rule in sector rotation versus the impact of individual equities that throw their weight around the sectors, indexes, and ETFs, which then begs the question, focus on individual consistent equities or ETFs more versus making sector rotation 
a primary priority? Uh, it's a really good question. I, and, and again, we have limited opportunity to answer that sort of thing. Maybe that's something we could dig into uh, a little more in the new year. Um, but I would say, yeah, this is what, I, I, especially institutional investors, this is something you actually dig into a lot. If you're looking at a mutual fund, if you're running a, a fund and you have a large number of assets and trying to think about it, you actually look at all those things. You look at how your returns are coming, you know, what percent of your returns are coming from your sector bets or your, you know, uh, asset allocation, meaning are you in the market or not? Are you in stocks or not? Um, how much is in sectors? Are you picking the right sectors? Are you picking the right industries? Are you picking the right types of stocks, large cap versus small caps? And statistically, you can calculate how much of your returns are due to your stock picking, due to your sector calls, due to your asset allocation, all that. That might be a little more than most individual investors. If you're managing your retirement account, it might be a little bit of an overkill. And I, I would argue for, for some money managers, it's probably overkill as well. I often would, would wish they would just keep it simple and just focus on getting in good stocks and let the rest of that sort of work itself out. Uh, but having said that, I think you could certainly look at, um, I think it's really uh, important, especially if you're looking at individual stocks and you're, you're building a portfolio of individual names, there are plenty of uh, capabilities in your brokerage platform uh, anywhere where you can roll that up into a sector allocation and just see what sectors you're making. You Because know, a lot of times you might think, wow, I'm just picking really good stocks right now. I'm in good charts. But it might not be your ability to pick good individual stocks. You might just be in financials and financials are all working. It might, you, might, you might not be, even be in the best uh, you know, stocks in that group. So looking at how you're allocated across sectors can be really helpful. In terms of what's right, it's hard to really say that it really is up to you and, your, you know, and what, what, what you're trying to accomplish uh, in your portfolio. So it's hard for me to answer that in particular. Um, but I would say that um, people I've worked with, uh, a lot of times it can be helpful to think of those as different decisions. Asset allocation is one decision. How much do you want to be in stocks? Okay, great. Out of that amount in stocks, where do you want to bet on sector rotation, bet on individual names? Okay, great. Within your individual name bucket, and that's sort of a... Uh, a way to think about it. Think about it sort of top down that way. Next question, just took my CMT level two and, and I've heard a number of those this week and last week. So congrats to all of you just for getting through that uh, exam. I, I hope it went well for you. And if not, I certainly encourage you to stick with it. I know many really capable analysts who did not have a 100% success rate on passing those exams, but, uh, but know their stuff and have done very well uh, as uh, in their investments and, uh, and professionally. So I'd encourage you to stick with it. And there's just so much to learn from going through that process. I, I learned a ton uh, from doing so. Um, my question is from the following names that just hit an all, a new all time high today. This is from earlier this week, this is on Monday, I think. What is your favorite going into January? I will indulge you and go through each of these very quickly. So number one is Penn National Gaming, P-E-N-N, -N, which is a decent chart. It's not quite extremely overbought, but it's there. And I like the relative strength uh, that's going uh, that's going higher. Okay, great. TJ Max, TJX. Uh, you know, an interesting chart as well. Not overbought yet, uh, and sort of just getting above its high from uh, from February. Okay, good. I got that one. And then the next one is PayPal. Oh man, brutal. Uh, and this one is just overbought. I mean, I mean. So here's the thing. They're all making new highs, and so in general. I've tend to want to lean into the new highs list because I, you know, I, I early in my career thought of the new highs list as something to avoid because you kind of missed out. But one of the things I've learned is, uh, you know, something like PayPal makes new highs back here in May before it continues up and gains another hundred dollars a share. So I've learned not to be afraid of the new highs list, but to uh, to embrace it. If I had to pick one, wow, that's really brutal. I would have to say PayPal probably just because I think that. You know, for me, that's a, it's a decent chart. I like the chart. I like the strategic position in terms of, you know, where it's at relative to e-commerce. And I think that group as a whole is going to continue to be pretty strong. I, I think this, you know, this emergence of the e-commerce names, it's not a new thing. It accelerated this year, but it wasn't coming out of nowhere. This is something that's been building for a while. So on something like PayPal, it is overbought. I'd be looking for a bit of a, of a pullback. And I think uh, opportunistically, I like charts like that that are pushing higher and other names in there like Shopify, I think are doing very well also. Next question, gold in Canadian dollars. How would you view the chart of gold in Canadian dollars? It looks much weaker than it does in US dollars. And you sent this chart, uh, which is great. So yeah, if you ever want to look at gold in a different currencies, this is how you do it. Do dollar sign gold, colon, and then the currency pair, um, especially if you're looking at something like uh, CAD, Euro, uh, British pound would sort of look just like this. Um, you have to do something a little different if you're doing a, a different currency, but that, that should look just fine. Um, and so what does it mean? You know, so as a trend follower, this doesn't change the trend characteristics that much. This looks very much like gold in U.S. dollars. I think the difference having, you know, thinking of the gold in U.S. dollars charts actually up here. So it's above its 200 day moving average. 
golden CAD is actually down here. It's below its 200 day. However, I think overall, they're both coming out of oversold conditions. They're both short term bouncing, but long term weak. I think for, you know, golden CAD getting above this previous swing high would be would be great. Getting back above the 200 day would be would be more important. I think golden US dollar, same thing. I think you're you're looking at these trend lines off the highs and, and both of them have a similar run off of the August uh, of the August high. I mean, what you're what you're basically doing with that chart um, uh, and not to just uh, jump around, what you're basically doing is, is is dealing with the impact of this. This is the Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar. You can see the strengthening there. And the inverse of that is the U.S. dollar chart, which is just going down relative to other currencies. And so that's what's making the values different. But the trend characteristics really are not two different one versus the other. That's all the time we have. Thank you guys all so much for some fantastic questions this year. I, 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 I To be totally honest with you, when we thought about opening up a mailbag segment twice a week, I was pretty uh, sure we would have to make up a lot of questions to, to build out the fact that we weren't, weren't getting any. We're getting plenty of questions from you and please keep them coming. We'd love to hear from you and you're giving us great ideas of what content to circle in uh, on the show. So thanks so much uh, again, everyone. We need to wrap this show and wrap this week by going to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the silver ETF, SLVs, the iShares Silver Trust. And, you know, gold and silver, we talked about gold there in, in uh, Canadian dollars, gold in U.S. dollars. The GLD is what we often will look at. And the SLV is sort of the, uh, you know, uh, complementary uh, ETF to, to GLD. I think when you're looking at silver, it's a nice, clear Fibonacci retracement. If you look at the low from March, you look at the high from August. We then pull back and have tested this 38.2% line a number of times. We're now breaking above it, and it's just testing the upper end of this sort of rectangle range for the last 10 weeks. I'd be really interested to see if it's able to break above and hold that, in which case I think that would signal a return or a high likelihood of a return back to around 27, which would be sort of that August and September high. If we pull back here, we have really clear support. So we're sort of mid-range in this sort of range here. It's sort of a wait and see mode. And I think you'll see silver emerge uh, in one direction going into the new year. So I think right now it's all about what we do relative to that upper end of this little rectangle. Chart number two for the three and three is Tesla, certainly finishing in a position of strength today, being added to the S&P 500. Finally, this has uh, been the, the number one stock in our large cap scooter ranking for a little while. This is not new. Uh, you know, something to look at as we're thinking of a stock making new 52 week highs, making new relative highs is looking at the RSI and a potential divergence here. It's too early to call that because, uh, you know, the, the trend is not over and it may just continue to accelerate into next week. But I'd be looking to see if the, uh, if, if the stock tops out on lower momentum than we saw in late November, early December. That would concern me a bit, uh, thinking of Tesla for long-term upside, but certainly the trend has been and remains positive. Third is uh, Nike. So it's interesting, this chart, I actually, I saved this earlier because it was a perfect example of what's called a hanging man pattern, which is when the open and close are right at the top. And then you have a long lower shadow, but this has now evolved. And do you know what this pattern is? Bearish engulfing patterns where you have an up day and then a long down day where the body engulfs the uh, range of the previous day. Nike's actually reporting earnings as we're recording this show. That distribution tells me to be skeptical of Nike going into next week. Uh, overall, the trend remains positive, though. Higher highs, higher lows. And I'd be interested to see if it does pull back, it's able to hold that 50-day moving average. Folks, that is a wrap for this week. And it's a wrap for 2020 for the, uh, the final bar in our live programming. Thank you so, so much for joining us, coming along this journey with us uh, for 2020. Um, as a reminder, our new, our year-end programming starts next Monday. So Reflections 2020 is running the next two weeks a ton of new content. All of our shows, all of our hosts have done a great job about peppering in some evergreen content, some really good uh, stuff during their own shows. So you're going to find a lot of good content across the board over the next two weeks. Next year, we're going to have a great year uh, for Stock Charts TV. We have three new shows that we're planning to launch in January into early February. So we're excited to start telling about those after the, uh, the New Year holiday. Also, our 2021 market outlook is going to hit in mid to late January as well. So we'll start getting that all lined up for you after the, uh, the New Year holiday. As always, keep your feedback coming on Stock Charts TV on this show, and please keep your questions coming all during the holiday season. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I wish you a great holiday season, a great new year. We'll see you next year. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.